Welcome to our Sound for Video session. It is the 24th of March, 2017. And in this episode, we have a few questions from a few of you. Number one from Greg Palmer. Hey, Curtis, when applying corrective EQ, do you start with considering the microphone's frequency response graph? For example, some microphones are overly sensitive in sibilance with a boost in the higher frequencies. For those microphones, do you dampen the higher frequencies in EQ, trying to bring back the flatter response? And the answer is, Greg, yeah, I think that's a good point. He's, uh, I talked to him a little bit, and he actually is referring specifically to the Senken Kos 11D, which is a lavalier microphone. That mic seems to be um, sort of optimized for wearing underneath clothing, so to hide it. And of course, when you do that, it cuts off some of the higher frequency sound. Um, so it doesn't sound as crisp, unless um, you have a microphone, for example, like the Kos 11D, that actually um, has a presence boost there. It actually boosts up the higher frequencies to compensate for the fact that in most cases you're going to be hiding it under clothing. If you use it in a case where you wear it on the outside of the clothing, it won't um, it won't be muffled by the clothing, so it's going to sound particularly bright and perhaps even a little on the sibilant side. The S's and the C's will start to um, get to the point where they're kind of annoying and grating. So the, the question I think Greg is asking is, you know, should you look at the re frequency response chart of your microphone and create a, perhaps an EQ preset in your post-processing software, your digital audio workstation, that automatically compensates for that each time you use that microphone? And the answer is just, I think you can definitely do that, and that can save you some time. The only thing I would caution against is don't automatically apply it and just move on without listening to it. Every situation is a little bit different, every voice is a little different, and um, every room's a little different. So using that same EQ time after time after time without critically listening to it after applying it can be a little bit tricky. So I would just encourage uh, people, to, if, you, if you do, make some presets like that. And actually, I would encourage you to do that. That can actually be a good time saver. Just make sure you listen to it as well and make sure that it's suiting that particular situation and that person's voice as well. Next two questions come from Steve. Uh, Steve, I hope I don't say your last name wrong, but I think it's Endow. Um, hi, Curtis. Here are my questions. Number one, I recorded a talking head video with the talent standing using an Audix SCX-1HC on an overhead boom mic stand to a Tascam DR70D. For those that aren't familiar, that's a hypercardioid boom mic that's pretty well suited for indoor dialogue. The audio sounds fantastic, but after normalizing the loudness, I can hear noise from the talent's long sleeve dress shirt. As he moved his arms to give a more engaging presentation, the mic picked up the noise of his shirt fabric moving and rubbing. It sounds like a subtle static or white noise. The noise doesn't ruin the recording and the audio is still very usable, but is there a technique for reducing or avoiding this? Do you ask talent to limit or minimize their movement, try different mic placement or angles, or is this a common issue that you just try to, to minimize in post? Um, I do try to address it. It's always best to address things in production if you can. Um, the number one approach that I would use to that, if it's possible, um, and this often isn't possible, but if it is, it's worth considering if you have a pre-production meeting where you get to talk to the talent ahead of time, and I know that's rare depending on the type of work that you're doing, um, but if you do have that opportunity, you may want to talk about uh, wardrobe with the talent. And um, for example, dress shirts, particularly if they've been heavily starched, can have a very crispy sound. <laughs> and as people move, there's lots of noise that, that comes along with that. Um, so if you can talk to them and actually have them consider wearing a shirt that A, they're comfortable in, that, that suits the piece, but if possible, that's not heavily starched. Um, and that if they can put it on beforehand and kind of test it, move their arms around and listen carefully and see if they can hear anything. If they can't hear anything, that's probably, the, that's probably a good choice. Um, so there's one thing to consider. Um, certain fabrics don't tend to make nearly as much noise as others. Um, heavily starched sort of cottons or cotton polys can make a lot of noise. Um, so you'll want to avoid that. If they're not starched, cottons tend to do pretty well, although a lot of the fabrics now are kind of pre-treated with wrinkle guard type stuff. And those can be noisy too. So it's really just a matter of talking to them. I usually hesitate to tell people to move less, um, but if it's really bad, you may have to do that. Um, and, and I wouldn't want to squelch that entirely. I wouldn't want to tell them to not move because you don't want a robotic kind of um, performance, <laughs> even if you're just doing... Uh, documentary, or not even if you're just doing a documentary, even if you're doing a documentary where it's supposed to be more realistic um, and they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily going to be jumping around and getting really animated, or maybe they will, depends. Um, in any case, um, I usually hesitate to do that, but if it gets really bad, you might um, work with them a little bit. If they can, oh, sometimes if they can lift their elbows a little bit, there'll be less of the fabric underneath 
um, on, you know, kind of on the arm of their shirt, rubbing against the body of the shirt, that may help to reduce it a little bit, but it's tough. It's really tough. So um, yeah, use that for what it's worth. In terms of mic placement, um, sometimes if you don't come down quite so steeply, like um, here, for example, I have a boom mic just out of frame. It's about a 45 degree angle, so it's right here. Um, but it, you can you can experiment with moving the mic out just a little bit and going at a steeper angle that's closer to parallel with the floor. Um, that might help a little bit because then you're picking up more of the, the voice straight on. The trick with that is that if you do that, if there's any noise behind them, any sound bouncing off a wall behind them, you're gonna start to pick that noise up too. So it's a trade-off. All right, second question from Steve. I purchased a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 audio interface and it includes a discount for the Fab Filter Pro Q2, an equalizer plugin. Do you use third-party pl EQ plugins? Do you think they add value or, or are worthwhile for typical dialogue recordings versus the standard Audition parametric EQ? Um, let's talk about that one first. So I do use uh, some third-party EQ plugins. I use RX's, um, it has a built-in EQ. And I also sometimes use Ozone, which is also another Isotope product. The reason I have all these Isotope products is there was a time two years ago or so that I purchased a huge bundle. They had a massive sale on RX and um, Ozone and um, Nectar and all these plugins that are pretty good for, that are actually very good for processing dialogue audio. And so I went ahead and bought it and it was a big bundle and um, it was an expensive one. I think it was close to $1,500 at the time. Um, before you say I'm crazy for doing that, <laughs> you have to understand that I do a lot of audio processing, a lot of dialogue processing. So for me, that was an investment. Um, it was an investment that pays off over time and saves me a lot of time. So the reason I use those is I like to have a practical reason if I'm gonna spend that kind of money. Um, I like to think I'm that reasoned. <laughs> um, but in, in my particular case, there are a couple of problems that the um, EQ plugins solve for me, the third-party EQ plugins. The one that's in Audition is actually quite good. It does a nice job um, processing audio. It, it, it sounds good. Um, I think it's a fine place to start. The problems that it was causing for me are twofold. Number one was a matter of time. Um, it doesn't, it, at least I haven't figured out a way to have it actually show like a, a real time um, analysis of the frequency response. So you don't have, you don't get that graph like we do with um, Span, which is a plugin that I've talked about before, which is a free one, which is a very good one. Um, it didn't have that in the plugin itself. And sometimes that can be really helpful in EQ plugins because you can see where the audio may be spiking and where you may need to do a cut. So that was one thing. Um, I could do it still. I had to have two plugins open at the same time and it got a little, it's a little fiddly. Um, not a deal breaker, but it is a little fiddly. Second thing is that the parametric equalizer in um, Adobe Audition is not does not operate in a linear phase fashion. What that means in practical terms is that if you apply a low pass filter or sorry, a high pass filter to kind of roll off some of the low frequency noise and rumble, um, what can happen with that plugin is that suddenly your, your uh, waveforms can become very asymmetric with the top part of the waveform being much taller or closer to zero dB than the bottom part of the waveform. And that robs you of headroom, which is really important when you go to loudness, normalize and compress and do all that sort of business. So the uh, EQ plugins in, well, the EQ plugin in RX for sure operates in a linear phase fashion. Fab filter um, EQ, which you cited that you get a discount on, that one also has a linear phase mode. So those are the two, and actually also the Fab filter does have a real time um, analysis um, frequency response charts or, or response graph. So that's really, really helpful. Um, you don't necessarily need them. And I'm not saying that you have to buy them, that, that only legitimate <laughs> audio processing uses third-party plugins. But uh, those are the two reasons why I bought it. And um, if you're doing enough audio processing, I think it does make sense to do that. Um, so there's the first one with that one. You also asked about DSing. There is also a, you said you also get a discount code for Fab Filters Pro DS. And you ask, is that worth trying? Um, the actually the DSer in Audition is actually pretty good. It's it gives you all the settings you need to do a really effective job at DSing and getting rid of sibilance, um, but it takes time. And I haven't used the Fab Filter Pro DS, but the one that I do use is one that again it's one of the um, Isotope plugins. We came with a with a 
plugin pack called Nectar, which is for vocal processing, dialogue processing. It's actually mostly, most people who use it are doing it for music vocals, but it works great for dialogue as well. The reason I like that one is that it automates some of that for you. It's very good at identifying where the sibilance is actually occurring. So really all you have to do is identify kind of a, a starting point in the frequency range at which you want it to operate or to look above. And then you set a threshold and you're on your way. And it does a really, really nice job. Um, the one in Audition, you have to go find the sibilance yourself. That's not an impossible task. It just takes time. And so this is another case where, for me, the Nectar plugin saves me some time and does a really nice job. So in the case of the Audition de plugin, it does a nice job, but you have to take the time to figure out exactly where the sibilance is for that particular person's voice in combination with that microphone, so on and so forth. So you have to do some trial and error. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. It depends on your budget. If you have the money sitting around, you're going to be doing a lot of audio processing. And um, I, yeah, I think it's definitely worth it. Is it nece absolutely necessary? No, I think it actually is really useful, in fact, to learn with the stock plugins in Audition, get used to them first, understand how they work. If you start to get to a point where you feel like, okay, these are holding me back or taking me longer than it really needs to, then looking at third-party plugins makes a whole lot of sense. So I hope those were helpful for you. Thanks for the questions, both Greg and Steve. And I hope everyone's out there learning lots about recording audio and post-processing audio for your film and video projects. And we will talk to you again next week.